Well, good morning, and uh, nice to see so many of you out here so bright and early. I, now I know why I just decided early in my career that I was not going to become a surgeon. Uh, having grand rounds at 7 o'clock in the morning is a, is a little bit uh, of a stretch for most of us, so I admire you right from the get-go. Um, we're uh, delighted to be here uh, on behalf of the college. Uh, I've spoken with Bill Gourlay, and uh, we decided that we would uh, put on a, a talk for you this morning. So without further ado, we'll move into the presentation. We're going to do a bit of a tag team here during the, the next 35 or 40 minutes. So uh, our presentation this morning, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the college mandate. Uh, we're going to review some statistics for the past year. Uh, we'll then drill down to uh, specific urology uh, complaints that we've received at the college in the past uh, two years. Uh, we'll look at what are the major complaint themes that come to our attention, how do we deal with them, uh, what's the outcome of the complaints, uh, particularly, uh, of course, the valid or, uh, or sustained complaints. And then um, throughout this presentation, we're going to try to keep things in perspective. So let's start with a little bit of a, a background. This is a historical so slide that really uh, looks at the, the legislation that the college has been uh, governed under going back to uh, 1886. Uh, we're now 124 years old. Uh, we were first known as, uh, as the British Columbia Medical Council uh, and established under the British Columbia Medical Act. We transitioned to the Medical Practitioners Act uh, for many years uh, until that act was sunsetted uh, May 31st of last year, and we moved under the umbrella of the Health Professions Act beginning June 1, 2009. So currently, we're one of 21 regulated healthcare professions in British Columbia, all of us coming under the umbrella legislation of the Health Professions Act, just to, by way of background. The uh, mandate of the college uh, is clearly to protect the public. Uh, we establish and endorse high standards of medical practice uh, by all of our registrants in British Columbia, and the vision of the college is serving the public through excellence and professionalism in medical practice. Um, we are unlike the BC Medical Association, I, I know most of you know this, the, the Medical Association is your advocacy group uh, that negotiates fees and, and, uh, and other uh, sort of uh, matters. Uh, the college's role really is clearly is to superintend the practice of medicine in, in British Columbia, ensure the public is kept safe. We are, as I noted, a self-regulating profession, um, and, and self-regulation is a privilege. In order to maintain that privilege, we have to demonstrate to the public and uh, to the government, quite frankly, uh, that <clears throat> we are taking our role ser seriously and we are uh, carrying out our legislated responsibilities. What I've done is I've taken a few of the uh, uh, legislated responsibilities, the so-called objectives and duties of the college, just to highlight two or three that are pertinent to this presentation today. Uh, and the first one, again, is to serve and protect the public uh, and acting in the public interest. Uh, the second bullet um, also is worthy of, uh, of looking at uh, developing and maintaining standards of education and practice looking at registration and, most importantly, in relationship to today's presentation, uh, looking at standards associated with professional conduct. Another two uh, uh, important duties, uh, establish, monitor, and enforce standards of professional ethics, and then to establish uh, uh, inquiry and disciplinary procedures, as well as, re of course, registration, which we also do and is a large part of our mandate, which are, and these are the four words that you see over and over again in the Health Professions Act, transparent, objective, impartial, and, and fair processes. So that's really just a background of, of the college. So um, I don't know how many of you have uh, uh, received the, uh, the beige envelope from the college during your, your time, and I can tell you I did 30 years in practice, and whenever I got a beige envelope marked personal and confidential, I'm sure my heart rate went up, I started to sweat, I started to breathe quickly uh, and uh, felt nauseous and so on and thinking, oh my God, you know, what have I done now? Um, but uh, so I think part of this is to acknowledge from the college's perspective, uh, Galt and myself having been in your shoes in clinical practice, we know how stressful this can be when you receive the news from us that somebody has complained about you. 
Um, let's look at uh, the number of statistics, or, sorry, the statistics for 2009. And this is a bit of, a, of an aberration um, because we transitioned, as I mentioned earlier. So there were some uh, changes to our processes, but we had roughly 1,000 uh, formal complaints that we dealt with last year for the entire profession. If you look at ethics and conduct and more serious matters, um, many of which are conduct related, they're close to 50-50. Uh, so generally speaking, we get about between 1,000 and 1,200 complaints a year. And some of them come, come in as general correspondence, general inquiries, which subsequently become formal complaints. So, uh, so just a ballpark uh, uh, background in terms of the breakdown. Um, we have a small number of what we call serious matters or serious complaints that come to our attention. Um, sexual misconduct, issues involving fraud, um, uh, gross breaches of, uh, of um, uh, uh, patient confidentiality and so on. And when you, when you drill down to these complaints, the, the very serious one, and keep in mind there are few of them in a year, so we're not talking about the majority, that they've got to do with situations where physicians put their own self-interest ahead of their, of their patient's interest. Uh, they um, forget about treating patients with dignity and respect, uh, and, and that leads to a large number of complaints. Exploiting patients for personal advantage, and, and uh, whether that's a financial arrangement, if it's a, a dual relationship where there's conflict involved, and of course the, the, the boundary violations. And again, succumbing to the temptation of uh, influences which could undermine your professional integrity. Uh, and again, in some cases, uh, serious breaches of patient confidentiality uh, and personal health information. What happened in, uh, uh, in 2010, uh, this is a, a snapshot over the first 10 months of this year and a breakdown. And this is one of the key messages that we want to deliver today. Of the total number of complaints that we've received, roughly 1,000, 1,100 in an average year, two-thirds of them turn out not to be valid. So remember, when you get a complaint against you, right off the bat, unless you've done something really silly or egregious, um, there's only about a one-third chance that your complaint is going to be determined uh, through an inquiry committee to be valid or partially valid. So uh, I've set the stage for you today, and I, what I'm going to now do is turn uh, matters over to Dr. Wilson to drill down to your specific complaints. So now we'll, uh, we'll talk about urology. Um, I, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be with you, in part because it, uh, it takes me back to my youth. I spent the first uh, 10 years of my professional life as a GP anesthetist in, uh, in Prince George. And uh, for some reason or other, and we'll get back to it because I think it's relevant to this talk, um, the uh, Royal College Fellowship anesthetist that does the slating and assigns the slates would uh, routinely give the uh, sister room to the GP. And uh, I don't know about you, I think that makes no sense at all. They're frail patients, they're very elderly, they have many things wrong with them, and you have to, uh, you have to give them a deep enough anesthetic to allow people to do unspeakable and extremely painful things to them, and then wake them up five minutes later and have them ready to go out the door. So, uh, and in those days, um, GP anesthesia training was six months. So, uh, uh, you know, I think there is a tendency for people to underestimate the, uh, the challenge of the patient population that, uh, that you folks treat. Uh, the other thing, speaking personally, a, uh, a, uh, a cold morning, 7 a.m., and urologists and coffee, it's a, it's a great treat for me. Um, it takes me back 30 years. Um, so here are the numbers, and they're not big numbers. The, uh, the risk, as Jack says, the risk of, uh, of any of us on any given day uh, being in grief uh, with the college is, is quite low, but over a two-year period, and 2010's not over yet, um, 16 uh, um, urological uh, concerns. And if we break them down a bit, um, it's, uh, let me take a step back. Um, a thousand complaints a year, uh, which doctors uh, are at uh, particular risk of uh, of uh, coming to our attention. 
Well, the top of the list, this is unscientific, but uh, anecdotally, based on my 14 months experience, uh, our colleagues that treat people in jail are number one. And uh, so if, uh, if you ever tire of your surgery, I, I'd not recommend treating people in jail. Uh, number two is psychiatrists. And it's not that they're not good doctors, but their patients uh, have a distorted sense of reality. So we, of, of those thousand, uh, we hear from a lot of people who are floridly psychotic. Um, that, and uh, I'm serious about that. Uh, number, uh, and, and those aren't the people complaining about urologists, by the way. Um, and uh, number three, and, and you might get into this, number three is doctors who do independent medical examinations for insurance companies and the like. And uh, I think that's easy to understand. Uh, it's not exactly a warm and caring relationship in that context. So four and five are surgical subspecialties. And uh, you're, you're close, but uh, orthopedic surgeons are, are the leaders uh, in, your, uh, in, your, in your group. And um, anybody hazard a guess as to why it might be orthopedic surgeons? Because it is relevant to urology. I'm trying to tempt you to say disparaging things about uh, personality, um, but it's not that. Uh, studies, for example, uh, consistently show that something like 15% of people who have total knee replacements end up dissatisfied with the result. So you're treating people, uh, a, a fixed proportion of whom are going to remain symptomatic for the rest of their lives and be reminded uh, that they wish they hadn't had that thing done. And in your specialty, incontinence, uh, uh, urgency, those kinds of symptoms tend to persist. And that uh, reminds the people that I hear from uh, about you in a way that's not positive. So uh, surgical complications, only four over a two-year period. Um, you see a lot more than four. And so the bottom line in a moment or two is going to be, uh, you know, what, what happened to the other 20,000 and why did only four complain? They're not uh, unusual, unexpected situations. Uh, in one instance, a, uh, a frail gentleman who'd been type 2 diabetic for 30 years had a radical cystoprostatectomy in a small hospital and went on to medical complications that patients uh, uh, with his background are prone to. He uh, developed an ischemic leg. He went on to suffer fatal pulmonary embolism. Um, and uh, in that case, the, uh, the surgeon uh, did a good operation, chose the right patient. There was some concern about whether he was in the right hospital, uh, but it was really a communications problem. Uh, this patient was at risk of dying before he went into the operating room, and the family really had no idea. It all came as a surprise to them, and, and that's really what we were critical of him for. Trivial things, say uh, a, a circumcision on a five-year-old uh, that, uh, judging by the photographs the parents sent in, people send us photographs, uh, it did look weird. And uh, we got an independent expert and he thought it looked weird too. Um, so uh, it, it's, not, it's not special stuff. Assessment and follow-up. Um, how many have already done rounds today? Um, and uh, how many found an awake patient? Um, I think it's, it's crucial to have a profile. People don't complain about doctors uh, that they like, that they feel a relationship with, and it's just a reality of your lives that uh, early morning rounds are made. Uh, but uh, my suggestion, I mean, I've, I've done it too. You go around, the patients are sleeping. What are you gonna do, wake them up? Uh, I'd suggest that you do. Uh, and, uh, and uh, make it clear to them that, you know, my doctor never came. And you came every day, your note's in the chart. One of the uh, hazards of uh, the electronic health record is that we can go around to the ward, get all the information we need from the machine on the desk, and hardly venture into the room. But, uh, but that practice is, uh, is what leads to complaints. Um, you'll see the others there, small numbers. Um, the next one is uh, Jack's slide. This is all about reassurance. And you may wonder if the risk is that low, uh, why you even came. If you didn't wear a crash helmet in your car this morning, uh, which probably would have reduced your risk of injury, uh, these, uh, these statistics uh, probably won't interest you. 
Uh, but uh, Jack likes to point out that there are over 10,000 of us, and if we average uh, 20 to 30 patients a day, and we work 46 weeks a year, um, that um, there are tens of millions of encounters and fewer than 1,000 complaints. So there you go. Um, who complains? Mostly patients. Um, I prefer that. That feels like medicine. Jack and I, uh, I think I drew the uh, good straw in that the, the uh, complaints that come to me are the clinical ones, uh, the ones about whether the right drug, the right operation, the right assessment was done. And, and Jack's the lucky guy that gets the, the ones about uh, my doctor's an unpleasant person uh, who I can't stand the sight of. Um, but uh, patients complain about both those kinds of things. Occasionally it's doctor to doctor and that's rarely fun. Um, we do get some anonymous complaints. The Act says that complaints will come in in writing, uh, but uh, if it's concerning enough, the Health Professions Act allows us to uh, um, investigate the competence of a doctor uh, without a complaint. And uh, these are mostly not fellows of the Royal College, they're mostly isolated, elderly, uh, general practitioners who don't have hospital privileges, who are working out in a corner somewhere, and somebody calls in and says, I, I think that fellow uh, is a hazard to the public. Um, the, uh, these days, most of the people we hear from have gone to the website, and they've uh, completed the uh, complaint form that, uh, that you'll find there, and they identify two groups of doctors, the ones they think haven't done a good job, and the ones actually they think have, and we write uh, to both, and I'll get onto that in a moment. Um, we, uh, we receive the uh, complaint uh, typically in writing. Um, the uh, complaint is sent to the physician who's the subject of the complaint. Uh, we get a response back. Uh, we get the charts. We um, ask other doctors what they think and what they did, and uh, we uh, pull it all together. Uh, these days, with freedom of information legislation, um, assume that everything, I mean, you're, you're already doing this, uh, I'm hoping, in the hospital with the work, WorkSafe BC, with ICBC, every document we write uh, is accessible by the patient, and that includes correspondence to the college. So when you uh, respond to a complaint, um, it's not uh, an appropriate time to sort of uh, explain why, uh, you know, if the, if the patient is frustrated with you, you are also frustrated with the patient, um, find somebody else to tell that part to, or phone me up and tell me, but don't put it in the letter. Um, we, uh, the the uh, patients, um, the, the most challenging uh, complainants uh, are now also aware that they can start making freedom of information requests almost immediately, so they may get your response uh, before the complaint is adjudicated and have uh, further uh, comments to make. So it, uh, it can drag out the process. Um, the, uh, under the new act, the uh, complaint is, uh, is assessed, screened, by uh, an outfit called the Inquiry Committee. And the Inquiry Committee uh, typically is a panel of uh, 8 to 12 individuals, two-thirds medical doctors, one-third uh, public representatives, they're all very experienced people, and, uh, and their task is, first of all, to decide whether this is a, a high-end uh, violation that deserves uh, disciplinary attention, and there are very few of those. We'll, we'll get on to that. Uh, disciplinary matters go to a, a tribu tribunal, a disciplinary panel, and is potentially heard in a, uh, in a setting that's similar to a courtroom where evidence is called, uh, witnesses are cross-examined and so on. Um, that rarely happens in British Columbia nowadays. Uh, almost uh, all of the serious ones are uh, uh, settled uh, by consent disposition where uh, the uh, essentially lawyers for both sides uh, work out what can be agreed to and what needs to be done. Uh, it saves you, as registrants of the college, money because hearings are very expensive. It saves the complainant having to uh, tell their story in public, and it saves the doctor who's the subject to, to, uh, to the complaint that embarrassment, and uh, it provides everybody with a level of certainty. Um, the, uh, the huge majority 
are settled informally where uh, if they're found to be valid, you remember that slide, two-thirds in fact are found uh, to be, uh, um, the determination is that the doctor uh, performed well and conducted him or herself acceptably. Uh, One-third needs some attention and it's, uh, it's generally a remedial and educational uh, remedy and we'll get on to that. We have 255 days to, uh, to get it all sorted out. Um, the final point, um, I, uh, it's a privilege uh, to, uh, to do the job I do and uh, after uh, many years in practice it's, uh, it's very interesting to take everything you've seen and done and try and uh, sort out uh, whether the standard was met in a whole series of cases. Uh, but uh, So I don't want you to think I'm whining here, uh, but uh, when I applied for the job under the old Medical Practitioners Act system, uh, things were, were easier, easier for doctors who are subject to the complaint and easier for those of us at the college whose job it is to sort it out uh, because the new act introduced a new agency called the Health Professions Review Board and that changes everything. In former days, where did this come from? You might, those of us old, those of you old enough to remember something called the conversation on health. Uh, every decade or so, the provincial government decides they need to uh, mend some political fences, so they tour the province, a committee of the cabinet typically, and they ask people to come in and tell them what's wrong with health care, and they write it all down, and then there's a throne speech, and they, uh, uh, they offer up a few um, responses. And at the, during the, the, the tour that was uh, tagged, the conversation on health, people said, you know, we, we don't like, the, the medical profession is like the police investigating the police. It's just, it's not transparent, it's not reasonable, they circle the wagons, they protect each other, and uh, we think there should be an in independent agency. And uh, so the uh, elected representatives of the people in their wisdom established a review board. And uh, the way the Ontario's had a review board for 20 years, um, BC is only the second of the 13 jurisdictions to get one. And uh, the way the review board works is that uh, it takes that, and I think it's, uh, it's reasonable, I don't know if there's anyone in the room who's been unhappy with the performance of their lawyer or their architect or their accountant um, and had concerns that it was members of the same profession that were adjudicating the complaint. So um, the, the way ours has rolled out is that uh, complainants who were dissatisfied with uh, one of two points, the adequacy of our investigation or the reasonableness of our decision can apply to have the, uh, have the, the uh, college process reviewed. And um, the uh, review board, uh, it, you know, it becomes a bit of a quandary, and we've heard this for years by the police. Okay, the police shouldn't investigate the police, but who should? Uh, and at some point, you need some professional expertise uh, injected into the conversation. So uh, the review board has no regulated health professionals on it. Uh, roughly two-thirds of the members uh, are, are lawyers by profession. The other third are very experienced citizens who've served on boards and and uh, done uh, many public type things. Um, but they don't have technical expertise and they're the first to admit it. And uh, it's their task to try to sort out uh, whether we've done an adequate investigation and come to a logical decision. Um, you might ask, well, how's it going? Um, the, the reason, here, here's the wine. Um, in former days, when the college said it was over, it was over and uh, we'd send a polite letter and say, we've had a really thorough look at this, and uh, as it turns out, there's good news. Your doctor did a good job, but uh, thanks for bringing it to our attention, and uh, you know, we're uh, sorry for what happened. Uh, now, the, uh, the disposition has to be highly polished. People take offense uh, with grammatical errors, with uh, uh, details have been overlooked, uh, minor questions that weren't answered, and, uh, and we have this other body that, uh, that will review it. And uh, what, what's the mind of the review board? Uh, are they, uh, do they tend to defer to the medical profession on medical issues? Uh, the answer is, uh, we can't tell you. 
it's 15 months out uh, on clinical matters, they have about 40 files and uh, they've only concluded one. So, uh, so the, the future's a little bit uncertain. Uh, what can you take away from, uh, from that? Uh, that uh, when you get the, the letter from one of us that says, we've completed our investigation, um, we think you did a good job, it's, it's not necessarily over. I'll turn over to Jack now. And I think what I would add is that <clears throat> the Health Professions Review Board is heavily skewed towards the complainant. The physician, if the physician is unhappy with the uh, disposition of the inquiry committee, um, unfortunately, um, you have no access to the Health Professions Review Board, unlike in Ontario where either the, the complainant or the respondent physician can appeal a decision. So if you don't uh, like the, uh, the outcome, you can write to the college. Um, uh, I don't think I've dealt with one yet, but there are avenues available. I think ultimately you could ask to appear before the inquiry committee and appeal uh, their decision uh, and so on. But the point to be made here is that this is heavily skewed um, towards the complainant and, and uh, you can decide whether you think that's a good idea or not. So um, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes just talking again about the common themes uh, that we see um, at the college. Uh, and again, friendly physician in the left-hand corner, and some days I'm sure you feel like this, uh, probably by about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're ducking and, uh, and uh, wondering why the heck did I ever decide to, uh, to go into medicine. Um, by far and away, the top two complaint themes are, number one, poor or ineffective communication. We get, uh, I, many of these come to my desk, and it's all, it's, the scenario runs something like this, you know, I... I waited in the room for, in the waiting room for an hour and a half to see the doctor. I finally get in, doctor comes rushing in. Um, I start to tell him what's wrong with my problem, him or her, and uh, after 20 seconds I'm cut off. Uh, I'm told what's going to happen. I'm given a prescription and I'm ushered out the door. I didn't have a chance to uh, ask any questions. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we'll get complaints the doctor was, quite frankly, was rude and arrogant, condescending, talked down to me, laughed at why I was there, belittled me and, and said, who on earth sent you here? Or sometimes the complaint is that, you know, uh, don't you have a family doctor? Uh, and we, yeah, we know that uh, there are a lot of people who don't have family doctors. You know, you went to the walk-in clinic, they had no business sending you here. And so instead of uh, dealing with the, with the matter professionally, you're taking, taking out your frustration on, on the patient. Uh, lack of empathy, concern, caring. Um, you know, we are in a caring profession and, you know, we all have those patients who rattle us and it's really a challenge to, to try our best to stay professional, to acknowledge their concerns, to show some empathy and compassion. Uh, um, it goes a long way. The second uh, uh, complaint theme is uh, really what Galt uh, showed, and it's much more common in, in surgical specialties. Uh, I think it's the clinical performance uh, at the cold face uh, that leads to problems. But again, at the top of the list, um, I, I, I had an interesting conversation with one of my colleagues last week who said, you know, when we get complaints that relate to surgical misadventure or whatever it is, it's surprising how at the end of all of it, when you strip out the real reason the patient complained, it was about poor communication. You know, they were willing to accept that the operation wasn't going to be perfect. But, you know, it's that the doctor who made rounds at 5.30, quarter to 6, never saw him. You know, as Galt said, your notes are in the, in the chart. You obviously were there, but uh, you didn't wake the patient up. The patient, uh, as far as they're concerned, you did the operation and uh, uh, you were the, you know, the resident or whoever it was looked after them, and I never got to see my doctor. I never got to find out what happened. Uh, poor documentation again. Uh, we see that um, um, from time to time. Um, the uh, failure to carry out responsibilities as most responsible physician. Uh, these are issues that come to our attention. Occasionally there'll be criticisms about poor drug prescribing or other aspects of, of clinical performance. Um, other, you know, areas that we get uh, complaints not uh, commonly, tardiness in completing um, third-party requests for, for medical reports. And, and obviously we know about the insurance forms, we know about ICBC, which I don't really think most urologists are going to be dealing with. 
Medical certificates of death, I wanted to spend about 20 seconds on. This is a real headache for us. Not uncommonly, we deal with about one or two of these per week. And the story goes something like this. You know, my father died uh, in hospital six days ago. Uh, the funeral has been scheduled for tomorrow. The relatives have arrived. And uh, we've been informed by the funeral director that they can't release uh, dad or mom's body or remains because uh, we can't track down a doctor to sign the medical certification of death. And we end up spending a lot of time trying to track you down. And uh, we, got, we get all sorts of uh, uh, excuses. Um, um, I was only involved for, for two days. Um, you know, there were, sometimes we'll see there's eight or ten doctors involved in the care. Nobody takes responsibility. And, and the message clearly is that we always have to think about, our fam, you know, about the families of the deceased. What would you do if you were in that circumstance? You don't have to be the doctor who actually was there at the time the patient died. If you have reasonable knowledge about the patient, a quick review of the chart, and in your estimation, if it's a natural death, it's not a death caused by accident, which means you don't have to notify the coroner, um, please complete the medical certificates of death. It takes two or three minutes to do. Uh, it'll save the families a lot of grief. Uh, access to medical records, um, again, Doctors not sending copies or photocopies or summaries of their medical files to new physicians when patients change uh, physicians for a whole variety of reasons. Um, I, I highlight commercial bonded storage companies uh, only to say that now as doctors are retiring, more and more of them are, are having their medical records. Uh, and again, this is somewhat archaic because most of you are using EMRs, but for those docs who are still um, using paper records. They have to store them somewhere. You're required to store them for a minimum of seven years after your last encounter with the patient. That's probably going to change. It's probably going to become 10 years and it may become 15 years. That legislation's under review, but currently it's seven years. So the doc doesn't want to take the charts home, uh, so they uh, sign a contract, the records are stored, uh, and then when the patients change, uh, physicians want a summary uh, then they, the request goes to the storage company. There are some excellent uh, storage companies in BC. Um, the one highlight here, and not to pick on DocuDavid, but this is an outfit that works out of Mississauga, and they've got a huge warehouse. And I can tell you, nothing makes a patient more upset in British Columbia if they find out that their records have been transferred to Ontario. And when they have to get their records transferred, uh, it means dealing with somebody in Ontario they tend to charge a fair amount of money in the order of $100 to $120 per chart transfer. So if you've got a family of four people, it could cost four or $500. And that, that generates complaints, believe me. Uh, so again, it's just a, a word of caution about, and it, it may not apply particularly to the younger docs. You're all going to have EMRs. You're all going to have everything stored on a, on a small disc, probably a USB stick by the time you finish. That'll be about... Uh, how, how you're going to have all your information contained. Uh, advertising breaches uh, are a relatively new area. I won't focus on that uh, in the interest of time. Um, number six is interesting that um, you, uh, as a healthcare professional in British Columbia, have a duty to report a colleague to their college. In the old days, under the MPA, uh, you were only obliged to report a fellow physician to our college. Under the new legislation, uh, if you walk into the nursing station at 8.30 at night and you ca catch Nurse Lucy in the corner injecting some uh, uh, morphine, or, or, uh, uh, that is a reportable matter, and you have a duty to report Nurse Lucy to the College of uh, Registered Nurses of BC. So that is a change. And you have the, so issues around uh, concerns about a colleague with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, uh, sexual abuse uh, uh, issues, if you're aware of them, uh, and competency issues. And so it's just a reminder that uh, uh, you have a duty to report. And if you go to our resource manual, we have an outline of, um, of various uh, acts in British Columbia where you have a duty to, to report. Number seven, professional boundary violations. Again, we don't see a lot of these, but when we do, they tend to be the more egregious complaints. Uh, sometimes complaints that are made of a sexual nature turn out to be more, uh, when you drill down, it was a klutz, klutzy examination. 
Doc's in a hurry. Male doctor comes into a room seeing a female patient. Rather than leaving the room, uh, having the patient uh, change into a gown, uh, opens up her blouse, sticks the stethoscope down uh, to hear the heart, comes in contact with the patient's breast. She files a complaint and says, that dirty old man uh, was groping me. And in fact, many times, it's just it's what we call the klutzy examination, uh, so please don't do it. Uh, conflict of interest, it could be business-related, financial-related uh, interests with uh, patients' dual relationships. And finally, the ones that make the, the headlines are the serious ones, the actual uh, egregious sexual misconduct and, uh, and so on. Uh, and I highlight the bottom one, altering medical records. We've recently dealt with a physician in the interior who altered records, uh, unfortunately forgot that he'd sent copies of his records to other third parties earlier on. Uh, the college uh, uh, was very critical. If you never, ever alter a record, if you have to change your record, put a line through it, add an addendum if it's an EMR, but never, ever um, um, tamper with the record that you've created. So again, in terms of uh, disposing of complaints, uh, when we get a complaint, Again, just to put this in perspective, almost 90% of the complaints that we get are, are preliminarily reviewed by either one of the deputy registrars or one of our uh, uh, physician consultants uh, who write up a draft disposition. It goes to an inquiry committee. They take a quick look at it. These are matters that are the, what we call the non-serious matters. About 15% of them require uh, the inquiry committee to actually deliberate from start to finish uh, on the complaint. And uh, at the, when you drill down at the end of the day of those 1,100 complaints, there's only about 15 to 20 that result in discipline, disciplinary action. And as Galt mentioned, most of them these days are dealt by uh, consent agreement. So I'm going to now turn it back over to Dr. Wilson, and hopefully we're going to leave some time for, for questions. So to conclude, um, what happens? Well, let's uh, we've we've been speaking positively about the two thirds that uh, are found not to uh, be valid. Uh, the one third, and uh, all but a handful of which are are dealt with through an educational remedial approach. Uh, here's what we're looking for, and uh, when you formulate your response letter, uh, here's what's really helpful. Um, this uh, this problem arose because. Uh, we've got a poor system in our hospital for, or in our office for uh, making sure that path reports are on the chart. Uh, I go around early in the morning, I don't wake the patient up. Find something to fix uh, and that's really all we ask of you. We, uh, our obligation, uh, if there's some validity to the complaint, is to uh, lessen the risk that it's ever going to happen again. Now, I can tell you one of the challenges of my job and probably why as a gray-haired GP I got the job is that, uh, that this reality is really hard for complainants to accept because, you know, of the 68 million encounters, the thousand people who complain to us, their hearts are broken. This is someone whose father has died, who suffered a stillbirth, who's uh, uh, had a psychotic illness and been humiliated at work. They are spitting mad and uh, Managing expectation. I know in hospital we have risk management. We, sh we should get rid of that terminology because, you know, right off the bat when somebody comes to me, I'm not a risk and I don't want to be managed. And so my task is to say, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that Dr. Jones made a mistake and uh, my job's made really easy if Dr. Jones writes in and says, you know, I made a mistake and here's how I'm going to correct it. Um, and then my task in communicating with the patient whose father has died is, but you know, so what, what do you expect? What are you after? Well, I want Jones to be shamed. I want him humiliated. I had one, uh, I mean, extreme examples, but it's not atypical. The stillbirth cases are excruciating, as you can imagine. And one of our complainants going to the review board, the doctor made some minor mistakes, young specialist. Uh, and when they apply for review, they have to say, what relief are they seeking? What do they want to accomplish? And this complainant wants the doctor to be obliged to tell all of her future patients about the death of her baby. Now, that's crazy. No one can compel a citizen of Canada to do that. But that's the, the complainants come to us with that expectation. 
It's a, we talk in the patient safety stuff that I'm sure you've been involved in about getting rid of shame and blame. Well, our complainants are right into shame and blame. And so um, the reality is, as a citizen of Canada, saying, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, and here's how I fixed it, that's almost always all that's required of you. And so I want you, as you respond to the three or four, or as a surgical subspecialist, eight or nine that you're going to get over your 30 or 40 year career, I, I want you to, um, to, to think in those terms. Um, how, did, how did we get here? Well, the case law precedent, just very briefly, is this. Uh, it, if you're old enough, our CMA president years ago was uh, Dr. Reddick from Whitehorse. And Dr. Reddick uh, got into, uh, was the subject of a complaint uh, because a 16-year-old patient of his uh, died of botulism from eating home canned salmon. And it was the first ever case of botulism in the Yukon. And uh, the doctor was not criticized for failing to diagnose botulism. That's not reasonable. But what happened was that uh, this 16-year-old was tagged by the nurses as a surly teenager. And when she said, I can't swallow, they said, damn teenager, here, drink this water. And when the water ran out of her mouth, they wrote something, it words to the effect of, damn surly teenager lets the water run out of her mouth. I can't go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. I can't stand up. And damn surly teenager, when she stands up, she collapses in a heap on the floor. The doctor took all this in, never asked the patient to show him if she could drink water or stand up. Uh, and he was criticized, and uh, the original determination was that it met the criteria for unprofessional conduct because uh, what's really required of us, to take a history, to do an examination, um, do appropriate tests, formulate a differential diagnosis, none of that was done. The, um, the Supreme Court, it went to the Supreme Court and was overturned. We're so fortunate to have CMPA legal counsel. Um, and the judge said these things, in, in the decision, the panel of three judges, the author, Justice Southern, said this, that an isolated error in clinical judgment, no matter how severe, is not unprofessional conduct unless there's an element of blatancy, of cavalier disregard for the well-being of the patient. So that's... That's a pretty high threshold. I think, you know, with, with that in mind, um, and that's, that's my communications challenge with complainants. If the doctor says, I made a mistake and here's what I'm going to do to correct it, that's really what's required of you. And I want to leave you with an example from your own specialty of, of exactly that. And this is a case where a mistake was made. The doctor's initial response was, I made no mistake. Um, the complainant got the letter under FOI and wrote some supplementary stuff in, and the doctor then said, took a big step back and said um, these things. I'd like to assure the college I've taken it seriously. The, the initial paragraph was, you're right, complainant, I'm sorry. Uh, I was defensive, but I did make a mistake. I've changed my office processes. I wish to apologize. Thank you for the opportunity of commenting. I hope this letter is of assistance. And from the college's point of view, from your legal obligation, that ends it. This person is still, but my dad died. Um, but, but basically, as medical doctors in Canada, this is what's required of us. Um, so final, whoops, um, take home message, right, relax. Um, so I want to leave you with, uh, with three um, urology-specific uh, uh, um, words of advice, because the, uh, the, the title was How to Avoid a, a Complaint. And the first is, take a leaf out of the orthopedic surgeon's book. Preoperatively, don't minimize risk. Um, if a patient, and, and so often, your patients are 85 years old, and what do we hear? And, and they, they died of complications that followed the surgery because they had so many other things wrong with them. So what does the family say? He was so healthy. Uh, he split wood. He, uh, he did the grocery shopping. He drove uh, uh, our children to school every day. He'd been type 2 diabetic for 30 years. He had Parkinson's. He had some early cognitive impairment. Um, 
make sure in your preoperative discussion uh, that people know that even if your blood sugars have been perfect, if you've been type 2 diabetic for 30 years, you've got vascular disease, and you're at higher than average risk of having bad things happen. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I think the perfect pre-op chat with an orthopod is a doom and gloom. That Your knee is probably going to hurt forever. Um, the urological equivalent is you've got a lot of medical problems, and this is a high-risk operation. That's... Uh, that's my second. Have a profile. Um, the pa patients, especially for the residents here, patients and families, think of the person who looked after your grandfather or your father. They they want to mythologize the surgeon, and so if you're if they do that, they're not going to complain about you. Uh, but if you're not there, they won't have that uh, that excellent raw material that you actually are for a, a, a legend. Um, finally. <laughs> Wake people up. Two things, very briefly. When you make rounds, if they're asleep, wake them up. I'm here, hi. If you're covering at nighttime, there's a catastrophe at 2 in the morning. The residents uh, know this, but uh, doctors ask this question, 2 in the morning. Um, you know, he's, he's crashed, he's in the ICU. Um, I don't want to burden the family at 2 in the morning. I'm not going to call them. The person who comes on at 7, they can call them. Uh, more humane, more kind. Big mistake, phone right away. If people don't know, if they come in, if they meet the doctor in the parking lot and dad's on death's door in the ICU, don't let that happen. No matter what hour of the day or night it is, phone them then, make sure they know. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. You're more likely probably to get hit by lightning on the soccer field than to have a complaint with the college anytime soon. Uh, but uh, when you do, uh, respond the way your mother would want you to. Thank you. Any questions?